For those who um, don't know me, my name is Joshua White. I direct a ministry called the Thinking Generation Ministries. It's focused on true education, especially for the family, although I do work with schools around the world also. This morning's topic is Daniel chapter zero. Do you have that chapter in your Bibles? <laughs> we talk a lot about Daniel chapter one and two and three and the lion's den and that whole story. Daniel's success, we like to focus on. But what prepared Daniel for his success? Amen. What enabled him to have success? Because if we don't know what enabled him to have success, how are we going to have the same success? Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Our Father in heaven, as we open your word, I pray that you will teach us. I pray that you will open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. I pray that you will speak to us, that you place a hedge of angels around this place. And Lord, may you present this message through me. May these words be yours and not my own. For I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question. Daniel and his friends are representatives of Earth's final generation. Daniel and his friends represent that generation which will be God's remnant last day's people. But in which ways do Daniel and his friends represent the final generation? There are many ways in which they represent the final generation, but I'd like to ask you, in which ways do Daniel and his friends represent the final generation? Any ideas? Okay, their character. That's really a basic fundamental aspect that their character was such that God needs his last generation to be. Very good point. What others? Okay, I heard diet. Yes, Daniel and his friends were tested on the matter of diet, just as God's last day people are given a message on health. Excellent point. There was someone else that said? Courage. Okay, they were courageous. Absolutely. And Committed to truth, amen. Both are, yes, in the back there, in the yellow? Okay, refused to bother the king of Babylon. So this is an issue of worship, right? They were tested on the matter of worship, both in bowing down to the golden image, as well as Daniel in the lion's den, representing um, some issues of worship, just as, just as God's last days people are tested on the matter of worship. In the back there, a hand up. Okay, true, loyal, and faithful. Amen, back there. Okay, you're, you're stealing my thunder, brother. Their education, absolutely. We're going to look at that this morning. And there are many other ways that we could look at. I'll just mention a few. They were a remnant, were they not? A remnant called out of or taken away from, from their homes in the nation of Judah, just as God's last days people are a remnant. They... Um, We've already mentioned they were tested on the matter of diet, on health. They were tested on the matter of worship. They lived in a prophetic time period, just as God's last days people live in a prophetic time period. Daniel specifically is a representation of the 144,000 because, well, for a couple of reasons. Daniel lived through the time when physical Babylon ruled the world up until the time of Cyrus, which we know from prophecy is a type of Christ. Just as God's last days people, the 144,000, live through a time when spiritual Babylon rules the world up until Jesus comes. And then there was, there's one other key characteristic. What was the problem that Daniel's enemies had in the issue of the lion's den? They couldn't find fault in him. What does the Bible say about the character of the 144,000? Without fault, without guile. Do you want to be like Daniel and his friends? What gave them success? We're going to study what gave them success. And it boils down to their education. But you say, really? Do we have Daniel chapter zero? I mean, do we have something that tells us how they were educated? Absolutely, we do. I want to study that this morning. And uh, for that, we need to go back to the beginning of the world. We're going to look from the book Education and look at the original model of education and then trace this down through history. Buckle your seatbelts. We're going to go on a, on a whirlwind history tour of true education since the beginning. So we read the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. Does this apply to us today? 
Well, it must if it was for all after time. Okay, now, what were the components of this plan of education God established in the beginning? Any good educational program has four components. We've got to have a place to study or a classroom. We need a textbook or something to study. What else do we need? Teachers, all right, and? And some students. All right, did we have that in the Garden of Eden? Let's continue reading. We find that the Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The creator himself, that's God the Father, by the way, was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. So the Garden of Eden was an educational program. It was a school designed to perfect their already perfect characters even more to be like God. Now, there's a couple of components I want us to take from this. It says that the creator himself was the instructor. So if the creator was the instructor, what was the content of the instruction? If you are listening to God talking to you, what are you hearing? His words. All right. So at the very beginning, the word of God was the content of his plan of education. And of course, we had nature because nature was the lesson book. So we could say the word and the works of God. Now, what was the unit of organization we find here at the beginning? If we continue reading, we find the system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God, and it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. So, at the very beginning, the content of true education was the word of God. The Unit of organization was the family, and the teacher was God himself. What a beautiful plan of education. But then sin entered the world. Did it stay this way? Sadly, some things changed, didn't they? What changed? Let's again go back to the book Education. Let's analyze what changed. In the divine plan of education, as adapted to man's condition after the fall, Christ stands as representative of the Father. Oh, so what did we lose here? (laughs) The teacher, right? Christ is now representing the Father who was originally teaching. He is the connecting link between God and man. He is the great teacher of mankind, and he ordained that men and women should be his representatives. The family was the school, and the parents were the teachers. So now we have a new elevated uh, position of parental responsibility in God's plan of education after sin entered the world. But let's analyze this. Did the content change? Or is it still the Word of God? Still the Word of God. That never got thrown out. Is uh, the unit of organization still the family? Absolutely. That wasn't dispensed with. So what changed? It was the teacher. The content is now the Word and the works of God, just as it was since the beginning. The unit of organization is the family, but the teachers became Jesus, representing God, teaching through the parents to the children. This is the divine plan of education as adapted to man's condition after the fall. Are we after the fall or before the fall? Okay, we're after the fall. We all recognize that, right? (laughs) So this represents our condition right now. Now, we could just stop here and say, wow, great. This is true education for us right now. But let's continue. I want to get to Daniel's story. Let's fast forward in history a little bit to the days of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We read, the education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs. For the schools thus established, God provided the conditions most favorable for the development of character. We should pause right there, right? What are the conditions most favorable for the development of character? An education centering in the family, and that has never been done away with. They were tillers, uh, sorry, the people who were under his direction were still pursued the plan of life he had appointed in the beginning. Those who departed from God built for themselves cities, but the men who held fast God's principles of life dwelt among the fields and the hills. There's a whole sermon right there in our message on country living. They were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds, and in this free, independent life, with its opportunities for labor and study and meditation, they learned of God and taught their children his works and his ways. Okay, let's analyze again. What's the content here? God's works and his ways, spending time in nature. Who are the instructors here? It's the parents teaching their children. And what's the unit of organization? It's the family. But now, let's fast forward in history. The time of Moses. Who was Moses' teacher? His mother, all right? Let's read a little bit about Moses' teacher. It was with 
deep gratitude that Jochebed entered upon her now safe and happy task. She faithfully improved her opportunity to educate her child for God. She knew that he must soon be given up to his royal mother to be surrounded with influences that would tend to lead him away from God. All this rendered her more diligent and careful in his instruction. Now let's just think about there. She didn't know how long she would have her child, did she? We know she had him for 12 years, but she didn't know that. She knew she was just caring for him for a limited time, and then she would need to give him up to his royal mother. And it says all this rendered her more diligent and careful in his instruction. Mothers, if you knew you only had 12 years, and then your son would be taken away from you, would it change your parenting? You don't have to raise your hand, but think about that. Would it change your parenting? Would you begin to make every moment count to prepare them for the crisis that was coming? She kept the boy as long as she could, but was obliged to give him up when he was about 12 years old. The lessons learned at his mother's side could not be forgotten. They were a shield from the pride, the infidelity, and the vice that flourished amid the splendor of the court. Who was the teacher? The mother. What was the content? Word and works of God. What were the results? Spiritual strength. How about Samuel? How long did Samuel's mother have him for? Just three or four years. Was she successful? We read during the first three years of the life of Samuel the prophet, his mother carefully taught him to distinguish between good and evil. By every familiar object surrounding him, she sought to lead his thoughts up to the Creator. She made every moment count to prepare her son for the crisis. His early training led him to choose to maintain his Christian integrity. What a reward was Hannah's, and what an encouragement to faithfulness is her example. What about the education of David? We could see this story over and over. I want to get to the story of Daniel. (laughs) But the point is this, over and over, when families were faithful to obey the command of God, that command which said, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. When families were faithful to obey this command, they raised youth with spiritual strength. But now I want to get to the story of Daniel. This is the heart of our study this morning. A man who exhibited a spiritual strength seen in but few in history. A man who, even as a youth, stood for his faith at any cost. A man who represents those who will stand in earth's final generation. What was his training? What prepared him? Daniel's parents followed God's plan of education. And we're going to look at this a little bit in the events that surrounded his upbringing in 2 Kings momentarily. But before we get there, I want to read something to us from the book Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 95. God commanded the Hebrews to teach their children his requirements. So this wasn't optional. This was a command. This is what you are to do. And to make them acquainted with all his dealings with their people. The home and the school were one. They were to work together. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of father and mother were to give instruction to their children. Sorry, I should get it there. (laughs) Thoughts of God were associated with all the events of daily life in the home dwelling. The mighty works of God in the deliverance of his people were recounted with eloquence and reverential awe. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed upon the young mind. It became acquainted with the true, the good, and the beautiful. All right. So it was centered in the family. The content was truth, nature, sacred history. It was true education based in the Word of God. But then how was this done, and at what age did this begin? By the use of figures and symbols, the lessons given were illustrated and thus more firmly fixed in the memory. We have an illustration of this in the sanctuary services. What a beautiful plan of figures and symbols and illustrations of the plan of salvation. Through this animated imagery, the child was almost from infancy initiated into the mysteries, the wisdom, and the hopes of his fathers, and guided in a way of thinking and feeling and anticipating that reached beyond things seen and transitory to the things to the unseen and eternal. And there's a lot here, but let's notice the age this began. Did the parents wait until the child was 12 years of age and 
okay, now it's time we better get serious about spiritual instruction. No, it says from infancy. In other words, parents recognized the shortness of time. They recognized that the greatest success would be by starting in infancy. We should do the same. Now, what were the results? From this education, many a youth of Israel came forth vigorous in body and mind, quick to perceive and strong to act, the heart prepared like good ground for the growth of precious seed, the mind trained to see God in the words of revelation and the scenes of nature, the stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the babbling brooks all spoke to him, and the voices of the prophets heard throughout the land many response in his heart. Now, this is a beautiful plan of education. But I hear the question in your mind, okay, this is, you know, this is interesting, but <laughs> what does this have to do with Daniel? <laughs> How do we know this was Daniel's education, or even was it? The very next paragraph tells us, such was. In other words, that description we've just read about, this was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen, of Samuel by the faithful Hannah, of David in the hill dwelling in Bethlehem, and of, of Daniel. Of Daniel. And, right, those three also. <laughs> How was Daniel educated? We're not left to guess. We have a description right here how he was prepared for his work, to stand for his faith. Now, I want to go back to this description, and I want to identify three key components of Daniel's education. I've highlighted them here. We find the words of revelation. Now, what would we call that today in modern terminology? The Word of God, the Bible, exactly. We're getting to the spirit of prophecy in just a moment. <laughs> The words of Revelation is the Bible. Okay, we have the Bible today. The scenes of nature. We should be surrounding ourselves with the scenes of nature. And the voices of the prophets. What would we call that today? The spirit of prophecy. All right. So true education, the content of it. Now, this afternoon, we're going to be getting into the method of instruction. But the content of true education is the word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. And I want to ask her the question, do we have this available to us today, yes or no? <laughs> it was available to Daniel, but was he just special somehow? He had something we don't have? No, we have the same thing available to us today. We have the Word of God more than Daniel had. We have a com more complete version than Daniel had. <laughs> we have nature, and we have more of the spirit of prophecy than he ever had. We're blessed. We have everything we need to prepare us for the crisis that is coming. The environment we find was the home. The teachers were the father and mother. The instructional material was the word of God, nature and the spirit of prophecy. And the results were spiritual strength. This is God's formula. <laughs> God's formula of preparation for the crisis. But now to understand Daniel's story more fully, we need to go about 100 years before his birth. So turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 0 and verse 1. That's found in the book of 2 Kings and chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Now we know the story we find here in 2 Kings. I'm not going to get into all of it this morning. We know we find Hezekiah on his deathbed. We find that he has prayed for healing. God assures him of his healing and gives him a sign. Who remembers what the sign was? The sun turned back. Okay. Now, when the sun turned back, this caught, well, the attention of the world, right? <laughs> kind of grabs your attention. And it especially caught the attention of the Babylonians, because the Babylonians were ardent students of astronomy, and they even worshipped the sun. And it really grabs your attention when your god moves. <laughs> And they heard on the global news channels, Hezekiah the king healed from his sickness. Sun goes backwards. They said, we need to go visit Hezekiah. We want to find out about his God. So they traveled there. They visited him. Hezekiah, congratulations on your healing. We're very happy for that. But what we really want to know about is your God. Because your God is more powerful than ours, evidently. Because your God just moved our God. <laughs> Tell us about your God. 
And what did Hezekiah do? Ah, friends, the power of pride on the human heart. Showed him all his treasures. And that just by itself, that wasn't very intelligent, was it? Who does that? Invites a total stranger to your house and shows him everything you have? It's just not very smart to begin with. But nonetheless, (laughs) that was what Hezekiah did. And as those Babylonian visitors walked out, in came Isaiah the prophet. Hezekiah. Who were those men? Oh, they were from Babylon. Really, how exciting. What an opportunity you had to tell them about our God. Did you? Oh, I showed him everything I had. And Isaiah said, what were you thinking? (laughs) What were you thinking? And a prophecy is here given. Verse 16, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 16. Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Everything that you just showed them, Hezekiah, they're going to take it all. It's going to be gone. But there's more. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now imagine that right now, at this period in Israel's history, can we go to the next slide? That you are a mother with sons. You've heard the prophecy. You've heard the mistake of the king. And you know that your sons may be taken from you to serve in the court of the king. Do you recognize the application to our day, friends? Amen. What would you do? Would you choose to make every moment count to prepare them for what was coming? This choice was presented to every Hebrew mother. And I want to read something from one of our early pioneers, Stephen Haskell, in his book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet. He says, three years after his life had been saved, a son was born to Hezekiah. Notwithstanding the recent prophecy, Hezekiah and his wife Hephzibah failed to teach the young Manasseh in the way of truth. He was but 12 years of age when he came to the throne, but if he had been trained in the fear of God, he would not have chosen the worship of the heathen. At the age of 12 years, Christ made a decision which saved the world. At the same age, Manasseh chose a course which brought ruin to the nation. In the training of your child, are you Hephzibah or Mary? Something to think about. And yet the Lord was merciful. As we progress through Daniel chapter 0, we find Manasseh ruling for 55 long years. A sad period of time in Israel's history. Long enough, though, for a generation to pass. Long enough for people to forget about that prophecy of the captivity. Long enough for people to start saying the same things they say now about Jesus coming. It's coming. (laughs) Sometime. Soon. Yeah, soon. We'll know it when it gets here. But losing that sense of urgency of preparation for the crisis that is coming. And then Manasseh's son, Amnon, was assassinated for his wickedness after only two years of reigning. And then we come to good King Josiah. Do we have any eight-year-olds here today? Any eight-year-olds? All right, we have an eight-year-old back there. Can you imagine being king at eight years of age? (laughs) He's not sure. (laughs) Josiah began to reign at eight years of age, and I wish we had a little more information about his training, but evidently there was something about his mother that um, really impressed upon his mind, the need to be faithful to God. But whatever it was, the Bible says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He turned to the, neither to the left hand nor to the right. He focused on serving the Lord. And more than that, he focused on turning his people back to the worship of God. As they traveled around the country, he cast down the idols and the high places and reinstituted the worship of the Passover and the, the national feast and and festivals and did everything in his power to bring people back to the worship of God. And then as Josiah was conducting his reforms, they were in the process of restoring the temple. 
And as they were restoring the temple, they found something. Who remembers what they found? The book of the law. The book of the law. Now, if something was found, what happened to it previously? It was lost, right? So what brought about the neglect and, and the apostasy of Manasseh and Amnon was a losing or a dispensing of, maybe it's intentionally losing, but nonetheless, they were getting rid of, they were setting aside the book of the law. Now they found the book of the law and thus began the first step in educational reform. Let's talk about educational reform in the story of Josiah. The first was a return to the Word of God. We saw that the content of true education is the Word of God. So educational reform would mean a return to the Word of God. And that is the first thing that Josiah did. They studied the book of the law. What was in the book of the law? Well, in the Hebrew mind, when this is written, it says the book of the law, a large portion of the book of the law would have been the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, as we know, sets forth the blessings and the curses, the need for adherence to the word of God. But what is special about the book of Deuteronomy is it is a book detailing the instruction, the education that Israel's children were supposed to receive. We know the verse well about these words, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Teach them diligently to your children. But that's not an isolated verse. Education is, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy is a pact or a covenant of the children of Israel as to the education they were going to give their children. And so as Josiah is reading and learning the book of the law, he says, wow, we have failed as a people. These prophecies of destruction are going to come to pass, but we have failed in the education of our children. We read, as the king read of the prophecies of swift judgment upon those who should persist in rebellion, he trembled for the future. The perversity of Judah had been great. What was to be the outcome of their continued apostasy? Friends, do we tremble for the future? Do we understand our need for an education in the word of God? Do we understand that our prosperity and our survival depends upon our adherence to the Word of God? What will be our response as we understand our departures from the Word of God? I pray that we won't rend our clothes, but that we'll rend our hearts. And as Josiah returned to the Word of God, he next returned to the spirit of prophecy. We saw this was a key component in true education. Josiah said, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me. And they went to hold of the prophetess. Josiah said, I understand from the word of God that destruction is coming. I understand the need for an education based on the word of God. What should I do next? He said, Go, inquire of the Lord for me to hold of the prophetess. And I find it fascinating that it was a prophetess just prior to the Babylonian captivity. Do God's people have a prophetess just prior to the spiritual Babylonian captivity? And what did the king hear as he talked, or as his messengers talked with the prophetess? He said, I've done everything I can. I've, I've turned my nation back to the worship of God. Can we avert the doom that is coming? And the message was no. Sadly, because of the sins of your fathers, the crisis will still come upon your people. But it won't come upon you and during your reign. It will come after that. What was Josiah's response? What was Hezekiah's response? We didn't read it, but if you go back to that chapter and you read Hezekiah's response to that prophecy about the destruction, he said, well, it's okay as long as it doesn't come in my day. <laughs> was that Josiah's response? That would be the human response, right? Destruction is coming, but it won't come during your reign. You'd be like, okay, whew, doesn't apply to me. <laughs> that wasn't what Josiah did, though. Josiah said, if a crisis is coming upon us, I want to do everything in my power to prepare my people for what is coming. I want to educate them for the crisis. I want to turn them even more to the word of God. 
recognizing this is our only safety, this is our only hope to survive what is coming upon us. And here we find the third step in his educational reform, an education of the family. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 23. Here we get toward the end of Daniel chapter 0. 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Listen here how many times the Bible uses the word all. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Who came to listen to the reading of the law? All, the Bible says. Everybody. I love our picture that we've seen here. We have the children, the parents, the elders, the scribes, the the priests, the king. Everybody is there listening to the reading of the law. But what is most amazing is the date that this occurred. If you look at the Bible chronology, it's quite easy to trace. This was one or two years before Daniel was born. So if all the people came to listen to the reading of the law, who was in that audience? Daniel's parents. And what did they hear? What did Daniel's parents hear? They heard the book of Deuteronomy. They heard that book detailing the instruction, detailing the education which their children were supposed to receive. They heard that obedience to God's word was the condition of being a light to the nations, that obedience to God's word was a condition of entering the promised land, that obedience to God's word was a condition of prosperity, that obedience to God's word was a condition of God fulfilling his covenant, the condition of of prosperity and the blessing of fruitfulness and of health and of leadership and of taking their place above the other nations. They would have heard that the word of God was to be esteemed as important as their physical food. It was the condition of them being the greatest nation. They would have heard the blessings and the curses and the condition of their crops being productive and their enemies being defeated and of being a holy people and of being the head and not the tail. And they would have heard the curses for not obeying, the captivity predicted, and that if they returned to God, they could return from captivity captivity. Perhaps they were even reminded of the Psalms, of how the Word of God was a condition of not being ashamed and a key to not sinning and of freedom. It was a source of meditation and on down the list. Perhaps they even heard the story of how Hezekiah's prosperity was obedience to God's Word. And then as they were reminded of all this, as they heard all these words, then they were told, these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. It was a repetition of the days of Moses. These words. What does it mean for the words to be in your heart? It means it changes you. It means it changes who you are. You apply them to your life. God is saying here, become the example of who I am to your children. Let my words transform you. And the world likes to stop with example, right? Just set the right example, let the kids follow along. No, that's not God's plan. Setting the example is first. True education begins with the parents, not the children. But it doesn't stop there. Then it says, teach them diligently unto your children. We're going to analyze this a little more this afternoon and look at the Deuteronomy method. We're focusing right now primarily on the content of true education. But this is what Daniel's parents heard. And then as they were awakened to their responsibility, their attention was turned to the spirit of prophecy. They were reminded of the, of the prophecies of Isaiah and of others, pointing to the Babylonian captivity. They were told that an inquiry had been made to the prophetess Holda as to whether the destruction could be avoided. And I just imagine the king himself standing there with tears running down his face as he tells them, no, my beloved nation, the destruction is still coming. Your children will be taken captive to serve in the court of the king. The very next generation is the one that needs to face this crisis. And as he appealed to the nation, he says, please, parents, prepare them for what is coming. Time is short. 
Don't waste time going into the ways of the world. Don't waste time looking at the other nations. Focus on the word of God, nature, the spirit of prophecy. We have everything in our possession right now to prepare them for the crisis. Connect them with the source of wisdom so that when they are torn from you, they could be trusted. And what did the people do? Well, four mothers, <laughs> the mother of Daniel, the mother of Han Hananiah, the mother of Mishael, the mother of Azariah, or maybe they were brothers. We don't even know. Maybe it was one mother. Regardless, they chose to obey. They chose to faithfully instruct their sons in true education, the word of God. They used the spirit of prophecy, nature. They connected their hearts with the source of wisdom. They obeyed the command given in Deuteronomy. Friends, will we obey? Will we recognize the shortness of time in which we are living? Will we realize the, that our children, the very next generation, possibly, will be the ones that face the crisis? Will we prepare them for the test? I want to go back to the words of Stephen Haskell again. Beautiful. God, or sorry, Daniel had a godly mother who knew of the prophecy concerning the destruction of their city. She repeated to her son the words of God that someday Hebrew children must stand in a heathen court at Babylon. Carefully did this mother teach her son to read the parchment scrolls of the prophets. This education was not gained in the schools of the time, for they had departed from the plan of God. Friends, is it any different for us today? Will we find this plan of education in the schools of our time? Sadly, no. Sadly, no. But, amen. <laughs> but holy mothers, living close to the everlasting Father, led their children by precept and example, by word and song to form characters that would stand the test. Mothers, are you following the example of Daniel's mother? What about the mother of Jehoiakim, of Zedekiah? Sadly, the capital was entered just like the prophecy said, treasures were torn from the house of God and devoted to heathen worship. Youth were torn from their homes. The bright star of the nation snatched from the shelter of their home and placed in the charge of Asphanaz, the master of the eunuchs in Babylon. And what were the results? Well, we come now to the end of Daniel chapter 0 and we get to Daniel chapter 1 and we know the story. But what I find fascinating, many times we focus on the 10 times wiser aspect after they completed their Babylonian training. But did you know that Daniel and his friends were pronounced well-educated upon arrival in Babylon? Upon arrival, before they went through their Babylonian schooling. Listen to this, again from Haskell. Now can be seen the results of the home training. You can be sure, friends, Daniel's parents were criticized for the choice that they made for the course that they pursued. The results were not apparent immediately, but when the crisis came, the results were apparent. Now can be seen the results of home training. Pure food, clean thoughts, and physical exercise placed them on the list of children in whom was no blemish but well-favored. But what of their intellectual ability? They had not been educated in the schools of Jerusalem, much less in those of Babylon. Was there not great danger that they lacked in the sciences or the essential branches? On examination, these four passed as skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and able to learn a difficult foreign language. God had fulfilled his promise in these children of the home school. Put even more simply from the spirit of prophecy, Daniel and his companions had been faithfully instructed in the principles of the word of God. How was Daniel able to have spiritual success, friends? This was not an accident. Those who stood alone in apostasy, those who stood for their faith in Babylon, those who were spiritually strong and those who represent earth's final generation, they had been carefully instructed in the principles of the word of God. Daniel's success was a result of his education. And Haskell asked the question, where are the parents who today are teaching their children to control appetite and to look to God as the source of all wisdom? Were these principles practiced, more young persons could be trusted as missionaries in responsible positions and in institutions of learning. Many will yet be called to stand before judges and kings. How 
are the children being educated? It's a question we all need to ask. Before we close this morning, I want to consider one other thing briefly. Remember that Babylon was powerful, yes. But it was not power alone that Babylon was famous for. Babylon was the educational center of the world. Every art and science was taught in the schools of Babylon. The wisdom of the ancients was made known to her students. They reveled in the study of astronomy and higher mathematics. There were linguists who could teach the language of every nation on earth. The king himself was highly educated. He granted the degrees. And into this proud educational center of the world were thrust four young men. Slaves from a despised race. Products of home education based in the word of God. Impossible, right? How could they compete? Surely they were not prepared to enter the educational center of the world. Yet hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? I imagine, <laughs> think of the story of Nebuchadnezzar and his dream. Who did Nebuchadnezzar call first when he needed help? His wise men, all right? But can we have a modern term for that? <laughs> These were the professors. These were the doctors of the Babylonian universities. And they couldn't do it. So then they called Daniel. He's barely finished his bachelor's degree. And he's able to interpret a dream that even his teachers could not do. How was that possible? Did Daniel just study harder than all the rest of them? He was just smarter than all the rest of them? No, friends. Daniel was connected with the source of wisdom. This is true education. Connection with the source of wisdom. We can repeat to our children the words of man and the textbooks of man and the curriculum of men all day long. But if they're not connected with the source of wisdom, they will not stand the crisis that's coming upon our world. Right. When we're faithful, though, to connect our children with the source of wisdom, we need not fear. They can be torn from us, but they can be trusted. God can trust them because they're connected with him. And this is true education. I have more understanding I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. And as Haskell says again, who will be able to stand the test when this decree to worship the image to the beast is enforced? Who will choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? What children are now being trained and educated in these principles of integrity to God? From what homes will come the Daniels and the Meshachs? This will be the final test brought upon the servants of God. How will it be for us today, friends? Will we be faithful to God's plan of education? I want us to recognize Daniel and his friends were not um, just happen chance decided to stand faithful the day they arrived in Babylon. It was a result of careful preparation. Let's not just hope and leave it to luck that our young people will choose to follow God. There's free choice, don't get me wrong. Let's make every moment count to fit them for the crisis. And in closing, we're told... Never. Can we have the next slide? Next slide. <laughs> there is no next slide? All right. Well, I'll read it to you. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. Education, page 276. Never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish 
until, let's pause right there, never. How often is never? <laughs> it's just never, right? <laughs> it just won't happen. Never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until the importance of the parent's work is fully recognized and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. I'll read it again. Never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until the importance of the parent's work is fully recognized and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. Schools are wonderful, we can have good schools, but education is not going to do what God designs it to until parents recognize the importance of their work and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. And you say, what kind of training? I mean, there's no college course on, <laughs> on parenting. <laughs> it's the same training that God gave to the children of Israel and to the parents of Daniel when he said, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. God says true education is simply being connected with him, studying his word, studying the beautiful counsel we have in the spirit of prophecy and becoming transformed by the power of that word and then diligently teaching it to the children. That's true education. That's how we can prepare our young people for the crisis. Who here this morning would like to commit to embarking on this plan of true education? on following God's plan, on preparing our children for the crisis. Anyone here? Amen. I want to invite you, if you want to take some time for prayer afterward, we can meet here in this room beside the piano. Also this afternoon, we're going to be looking at some vitally important topics. We've looked here this morning at the content of true education, but we're going to look then again at another story in the history of Israel at the method needed to impart this content of true education. So we're going to start at 2 o'clock this afternoon. I hope that everyone is prepared to stay the whole day, and we'll have three messages this afternoon uh, continuing in our series on true education. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so blessed. We're thankful for this instruction that you've given us, that you have taken the time to show us the education needed to prepare for the crisis. Help us to prepare, Lord. Help us to be diligent, making every moment count so, we, so that we can be found faithful workmen that need not be ashamed. Go with us now, please, Lord. Help us to keep you in our hearts, keep your presence with us, and honor your Sabbath day. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us today for our church worship service here at the Mentone Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're here to serve. So if you have a Bible question or if you have a prayer need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our phone number is 909-492-0738. Or you can email us at office at mentonechurch.org. And if you find yourself in our area, which is in the inland area of Southern California, please come by and visit us. We would love to meet you. And in the meantime, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click on the little bell. That way you'll receive notifications when we are live streaming. God bless. Have a great week.